Now I can let you know what we're doing here at RCM and Why we do what we do. We also have prayer cards in the pews. We pray for each other here, so you can see inside your programs how we pray for each other. We'll post it if it's public, and if it's private, and if it's private, then we will um, then we will uh, keep that on my desk for my eyes only. Coming up, also. If you want to see today's service online, you can see the church's YouTube page or Facebook page. No. Just search, search pardon me, Mercy and Methodist Church on free one of those sites. No. Why do I say that? Because, of course, we did know we have our Sunshine Preschool program this morning, which should be both a blast and terrifying, but that's another issue in itself. There was not youth group tonight. We had only a couple Thank students you. able to go for our bowling event, so we want to instead have youth group next Sunday night at 6.30 p.m. May 4th is the National Day of Prayer. If you're interested in 12 noon on the day, Thursday, what we're prayer events on the court, the courthouse square at 12 noon. Details are behind me as well as in your programs if you'd like to come on Thursday. There's also a prayer event for town specifically to pray about substance abuse issues in our community. That's on May 6th, beginning at 5.30 p.m. Um, at this point, Denise, if you'd like to make it, go right ahead for your part of the announcement. Okay, I'm back. Good morning, everyone. Um, the reason why we are getting involved and why we should be involved in the prayer for the Southern Martin Hall Lake Service includes, as Pastor Brian said, May 6th from 5.30 to 8.30 at the Courthouse Square. Amen services right now throughout Mercer County are out on an average per day of resuscitating five people. That's the end of services. 32 deaths are confirmed in 2016 for alcohol and narcotic addiction. Almost all of us have friends and family struggling with substance addictions. Um, the prayer march is also to pray about and address the underlying issues. So if you'd like to be a part of the efforts for this march um, and parade, or help with the United Methodist Church um, outreach table, or volunteer for the information table, or participate in the community <coughs> service, folks and are inviting you and welcoming you to attend Thursday night here at the church, a meeting to finish organizing this and our part for the church. It will be at 6.30. Um, again, I'll be here at the church. We all have a, we all know that we have a fantastic church family. Let this outreach event be a great opportunity to show others how cool it is to be a part of a church family and to invite them to join us. Thanks, Denise. And if you can't make it here Thursday night for that, contact us, contact us at the church office if you'd like to be a part of that uh, program. In between services today, we have our fellowship time in the fellowship hall. If you're a guest here today, you may realize we're missing a ceiling, mostly. And if you've been at the preschool, you understand what's been going on with the wall retention and stabilization project, and kids wondering what in the world is going on upstairs during school. Um, so if you're here for the fellowship time, because everybody's welcome, um, that is part of the reason why we're missing a room. <laughs> also, it's a great time to spend together, or at least tell the kids what a great job they did this morning. Our uh, first quarter giving statements, you can find those in the narthex there, which is, of course, the place where Gail is handing out bulletins as well as the offering plates and whatnot, but they're located. That's in the back of the sanctuary. Giving statements are there. We'd love for you to grab yours. And Linda Beach, you had something for me. Good to see me. Yes. <laughs> yes. decided in uh, July we wanted to take a bus trip down to the Gateway Clipper for supper. So um, we're going to uh, get a bus, and I think we're going to have up to four, <coughs> seat 40 people. So the price of the bus trip and dinner could be up to $140 a couple. We just want everybody to know the price before you sign up. Um, I need to know this week because I have to reserve everything and we have to buy the tickets. <coughs> and I'd surely like to have a payment by next Sunday. Um, once you buy your ticket, it's your ticket and it's your responsibility. So if for some reason you can't go, you'll, you'll have to find a replacement or sell your tickets. 
So the sign up sheet is outside the office. I really appreciate it if you think about it and sign up today so we can get an accurate count of who wants to go. Thank you. July 15th. Thanks, Linda. So July 15th. Friends, why don't we greet one another with a lot of friends? <laughs>
seated. At this time, it's time for our Sunshine Preschool program. In between services, my friends, if your youngster seems to be wearing lunches and they'd like to go downstairs, we have great nursery staff downstairs. But we also love kids being in worship, so if they're allowed to wearing lunches, it's my job to get louder. Otherwise, they can come.
to the youngest folks who like to come forward, that would be a great thing. Doctor until June, so 
he has to make do with how he is until then. So keep praying for Dale's brother Terry in the midst of this waiting to see the doctors and trying to come up with a plan of action. Thanks, Dale. Friends, is there anything else? One. Matt Rock has been on our prayer list for months, and thanks be to God, in the midst of everything that he had going on, pneumonia and whatnot, and there's healing going on. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Bonnie. Friends, is there anything else you want to give God thanks for? Have you? So let's be praying for Abigail's cousin's family, Helen, Helen's family. She passed away this week. Happy up, thank you. Friends, is there anything else you want to, be thank you want to thank God for? Praise God for who God is. Betsy. We had Kate and Sam home this week. They weren't able to stay for either Sunday. They came in Sunday night and listened to Sunday morning. But it was nice to have them back amongst us for a week. They have a hard, hard go of it down there. Katie's taken over the door of being like in charge of all the directors so praise be to god that sammy and kate were able to be here <coughs> kate mccall Everest is out of this church in a local from um, mercer area not like that but she's a missionary in mexico at this point so and it's a handful dealing with recovering addicts in mexico where uh, she and Renee, her husband, are serving. So be praying for them, as well as the joy it was for their son, Sandy, as well as Kate, to be here. Thanks, Betsy. Friends, is there anything else we give God thanks for? Praise God for who God is. For anything we need to be praying for. Then, we want to go to the Lord together in prayer. But what a gift it is to see kids' joy. It also reminds us of how Jesus calls us to become like little children, where for so long we've tried to grow up or be adults or be mature, and to see joy in kids' faces, to sing with abandon, especially when I'm pride. What a gift it is. We give you thanks, Father, for the reminders of how we're called to seek out Jesus like the kids do. Forgive us, Father, for how we try to be grown-ups, turn faith into a bunch of rules and regulations, instead of this incredible love relationship we can have with you. What a gift it is, Jesus, that you paid the price for us on the cross. That we can actually know your forgiveness. In spite of the whoppers of sins that we may have committed, you've wiped the slate clean. We can't even put into words the joy that is. And we probably can't even grasp the wonder of your incredible forgiveness for us. Father, we're asking that you be with those we've looked up this morning in prayer. We're asking that you be with Terry in the midst of the waiting for doctors and answers, let alone dealing with the cancer and whatnot. We're praying for healing and patience. We look before you, Helen's family, Abigail's cousin, and in the midst of their grieving, we ask that you send the spirit of comfort and peace to be with them. Father, thank you. You've answered some of our prayers, and yet in many ways you answer the prayers that we don't even remember, we don't even notice. And yet, we thank you for healing Matt Rocco. We give you thanks and praise. We pray for continued healing for him. We lift before you. Thank you for the time with Katie and Sam had here, with Betsy and Marianne and the families. And yet, we also ask, Father, that you want to protect them in their travels. And two, move and work in the midst of the ministry that you have going on in Mexico. Because whether it's here locally with substance abuse, whether it's the terrible addictions that occur in Mexico, Father, Alcohol and drugs are going to be ripping families apart here and ripping our lives apart. We're praying for your spirit to move and work. Open up our eyes to what you would have us do as well here. And yet, you're the God who is greater than the problems we have here. As horrendous as some of them are, as painful as some are, you are the God who is greater. The cross proves that to us, that Jesus rose from the grave then nothing can stop you, Father. So we give you thanks and praise as we pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. My friends, while we continue to worship as we sing together. Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of men, 
and you will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. And the second reading is from Matthew 26, 26 through 28. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, and eat, this is my body. Except I cut off two verses for Richard. So we carry on verse 27. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Amen. Forgiveness. We need God's forgiveness. Matter of fact, we ache for forgiveness. To know that all that we've done and all that we're ashamed of is forgiven. All of it. But all that we've done, done wrong that we don't even know about, that it's forgiven. All of it. Forgiven. There's only one way for sin to be get forgiven. And that, sadly, ultimately is death. Sin is serious. If anything, in our culture, we blow by, ignore the serious nature of sin. And yet, when we've dealt with those who have done terrible things, or if you've done something in your past that still haunts you, you know the serious nature of sin. Our culture seemingly blows off the serious nature of sin, and yet it's there. The cost is incredibly serious. Thanks be to God, though, that Jesus paid the price for our sin, that we might be forgiven. Forgiveness. We need forgiveness. Every sin, whether in thought, word, deed, or action, or those things that we didn't do, they separate us from God. And God sees what we have done, what we haven't done. Well, the story goes, as their wedding day approached, a bride and the groom were both becoming very nervous. One day the groom went to his father because he was filled with fear as he told his father, Dad, I don't know what to do. My feet stink. This isn't just bad feet stink. This is terrible. Father, you know it because the house is putrid with the smell of my feet. I can wash them as much as I want, but I cannot cover up the smell, especially in the morning. Father, Dad, what do I do? My feet stink. The father's response was this. Son, here's my advice. Wash your feet as often as possible. Not only that, but buy some of that perfumey stuff. Okay, get that. But especially wear socks to bed. Because at least in the middle of the night when your feet can be cooking all night long and the odor can grow, the socks will control the stink. The son said, Dad, that's great advice. Thank you. I'll do that. Meanwhile, the bride-to-be was terrified. She went to her mother and she said, Mom, my breath, I struggle with it, especially in the morning. My goodness, in the mornings, my breath is terrible. And Mom said, I know. She was filled with compassion. <laughs> I know, honey. So the bride-to-be said, Mom, what do I do? I don't want to scare or terrorize my husband. I want this marriage to last as long as possible. I want to be with him to the rest of my life. And so, the mother's response says, Honey, here's what I need you to do. Whenever you go, make sure before you go to bed, bed, brush your teeth, make sure you do everything you can, but as soon as you get up in the morning, don't even talk to your husband. Get up as early as you can and run to the restroom. Don't speak to him, ignore him. Just pretend like you're a very cranky person waking up. Okay, Mom, that'll work. I'll try it. The wedding day came. It was beautiful. Their night, their first nights together were wonderful. And yet, as the months went by, it became harder and harder to keep up the facades, if we can say it. The son had trouble making sure that he had his socks on every night. The wife had trouble making sure that she didn't speak to him in the morning. Sadly, one night, in the middle of the night, the son, the groom, woke up and realized that one of the socks had fallen off in the middle of the night. What do you do? The sock's missing. So he was filled with terror. I don't want her to know how bad my feet stink. He threw the blankets off the bed. He threw the sheets off the bed and started searching for that sock. Well, she, of course, woke up. As he was looking for the sock, she, without thinking, said, What are you doing? What's wrong? And the, and the husband suddenly looked at his wife and said, Oh, my goodness, you swallowed my sock. <laughs> we may try to hide it, but we need forgiveness. No matter what, we need forgiveness. God sees all, God knows all. The scriptures are replete. They are filled with how God sees everything that we do, the good and the bad. The things we want to keep hidden, God knows. Those things that we want to keep hidden in the closet, the things we want to keep in the dark, the things that we thought were only in our minds and our thoughts, God still knows. Thanks be to God that there's forgiveness. 
See, we need God's forgiveness. And yet, what is forgiveness? Bob, we've got the slide. Here we go. Ready for it. Well, some of you find this app fascinating. Some of you will take a nap, and that's okay. According to Don K. McKinn in the Westminster Dictionary of Theological Terms, that title is long enough for many of us to sleep. But since we've been on a sermon series about church words, and what are these words we just throw around in church that we don't know, we've been using this dictionary quite a bit. The word for forgiveness in Greek, it is suge, suge, co, rose, got it right there, suge, rose. All right, I'm not going to try to pronounce it again. That's more than once I've butchered already today. But suge, rose is the uh, God's action in pardoning or remitting sinful offenses, which includes canceling the penalties that such acts would have merited. Forgiveness of sins comes through Jesus Christ and is to be the mark of the Christian's life as well. We see this in our readings this morning from Hebrews. That Hebrews passage is, is full of deep theological things we're going to touch on now in a few months as we look at this, uh, another church word, atonement. We'll look at that in June. We'll speak more about this passage at that point. In Hebrews, we hear about why there has to be death in the first place. Every time a sin occurred, death had to, be, had to occur. That begins with Adam and Eve in the garden and carries on through. There is a price to pay. Because God's a just God, there has to be a price. And whether we like it or not, when we have a sinful action, it actually causes a mild, if not serious, death. Maybe it's a mild death in our relationship with God or with someone else. But it does occur. And if anything, I would suggest that we truly take our actions the things that cause ourselves harm, others harm, or our relationship with God harm, we take it much more flippantly than we should. God has this covenant, or maybe a word that we may be able to put it to effect in a better way, is contract between ourselves and God. And this contract, this covenant, includes the incredible blessing of God's gift if we hold to our end of the covenant. And yet, if you're like me, we normally fail. When I'm called to not do something, guess what I want to do? Besides keep the microphone from flying off my belt. Oh, pardon me. That was funny. We'll move on. Normally when there's something I shouldn't do, guess what I want to do? I want to do it. Speeding limits. Speed signs. What are the speed signs? Speed limits. There we go. Speed limits. Guess what I want to do? 55. I want to see how much further I can go beyond 55 before the police get closer to me. If it's giving up candy for lights, well, my goodness, the one year I gave up Snickers for Lent, I just substituted a whole bunch of other things. This year, Tina gave up candy for Lent. Guess who wanted to run around the house eating candy bars and popping jelly beans like they were vitamins? That was me. Since I did it often, I heard about it. Whenever we have something in our lives we shouldn't do, we are often tempted to do the exact thing we should not do. When we were teenagers, we pushed the rules, or maybe really flouted the rules. As adults, it might be cheating on our taxes. It might be other things that are a little simpler. Cheating on a diet, watching things on TV that we shouldn't watch. For me, again, it was the stinking of candy and, and those sort of things. But it can be so much more. Part of the, the, the addictive quality of pornography, of alcohol and drugs, is at least in part because we're not supposed to do those things. That's part of the award. Sadly, we as humans, sin working its way in us, desire to do what's not good for ourselves, our relationship with God, or, or for someone else. What we shouldn't do becomes so much more enticing. And sadly, then, it helps us miss the mark in our relationship, in our relationship with God. There is a price to pay. So we talked about a few weeks ago about God justifying us. Part of the reason why God can even justify us or make us right in God's sight is because God is actually just. He has a system set in place that doesn't fail. Our, our judicial system, as good as it is, still has places where it fails. God doesn't fail. But there is a price to pay when we fail. Sin this way, where we miss the mark. Leads to death within ourselves in some cases. I even simplistically put suicide as within of ourselves. Leads to death in relationships with others. Think of somebody that you failed in a relationship that you no longer talking with. Them. Getting ready for today, it hurts how many relationships I've had 
where I or someone else has failed in a relationship and that relationship is separate. Spiritually, sin, how we miss the mark, actually leads to death. But how do you pay for that? Well, somebody has to pay that ultimate price. And the ultimate price is what? Truly, it's death. And yet, in the Old Testament, which is what we heard in the Hebrews, is the point where what is the indicator that someone has died? In their day where they didn't have clotting devices, in their day where they didn't have uh, the, even the knowledge for tourniquets, they didn't have the idea of how to put bandages on, what often indicated that you would die, that you would suffer, that, that sickness and illness, if not immediate death, was coming soon? They didn't have stitches. You were in trouble if you were healed. That's why blood shows up so much, so many times in the Old Testament. We even heard it this morning and, and during our Seder meal here at church for Monday, Thursday. One of the things we talked about with the Seder meal is that for the Passover lamb, that celebration that the Jewish people did and still do, you would bring, you did it technically according to the letter of the law, you'd bring that lamb to the house four days beforehand. Now, after four days, what do you think happens with the kids and a cute little lamb? You've seen it at your houses if you've had kids with pets. I watched my sister suddenly try to put dresses on her cat. That didn't work out so well. I think she still has scars from the cat scratches. But they would bring the sheep into the house, and that lamb would be there for four days, and then it would die. It became a pet. There was a high price for sin. Or, as we heard in Hebrews, our reading this morning, when the, the covenant was enacted, they actually took the blood of calves and sprinkled it upon the altar to enact the covenant. Hebrews 9.22 put it this way, In fact, the law requires nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. God takes how we mess up seriously. We don't, too often. But God does. The ultimate sacrifice for how we've messed up, how we sin, but that forget us to occur, it's Jesus, a perfect person dying for us. Hebrews 9, or Hebrews 9, 26 puts it this way. He, Jesus, appeared once for all the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. He paid the price for us. He is that sacrificial lamb. That's why in Matthew 26, which you often hear for a communion service, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus paid the price, and it is a terrible price for how we've fallen short. He paid the price for us that we might know forgiveness. So, he paid the price that we might know forgiveness, but how does that actually work? I know you guys are going to sit this close. You've got front row seats. Beware, it's also spit row. I'm just saying. We've got a nice clean marker right here, correct? For those of you up front, it's clean, barely touched. I think I printed on this side once, although it's brand new. It's as though as soon as we were born, this is what we look like in God's sight. And yet, sooner or later, we act up. We act like little kids. We make... We say something, or we, you've never had babies so cry just because they want to be picked up, have you? It made me laugh when I would watch my niece now throw tantrums at times because she wants somebody to pick her up. Because when she was a baby, she was cute. I mean, she still is. Don't throw her in and say she wasn't cute. But there's a period or a point in time where it's no longer crying. It's for food or health. It's, I want to be picked up. Sooner or later, it gets to be, or we're selfish about it. Now, at first, it's just small, maybe little things, but they add up. Sooner or later, we have something in life that's pretty, pretty painful or hurtful for ourselves, a relationship with God or a relationship with others. And sadly, it adds up. Whether we do it or, know, do or don't know it's happening, we keep on doing those things that harm our relationship with God. Now, as we get age, as we get older, we try to hide from the fact that we've done this. We may even get to the point where we try to fool ourselves and say, oh, I didn't do anything wrong. We just hide it. Nobody will notice. It's okay. Nobody knows what I did. The problem is, is 
although it's upside down, I hope you get the point. We may have tried to hide it, it's still there. Not only is it still there, but if it, what I've found in my own life is this. When I try to hide it, it actually eats away at me more. I don't know about you. When I try to hide the things I've done that are wrong, that hurt others or hurt my relationship with God, it eats me up on the inside. And if anything, with the lying to cover it up, to hide it, to pretend, it keeps on getting worse. Well, that's sis, not sin. Don't tell my sister I wrote that. <coughs> it keeps adding up. We try to pretend like it's not there. Not as you can saw it. As you can saw it. Did I really say it that way? You like my grandma this morning? If you can see, I use my finger there, but what's hilarious is when I've got a little bit of that whiteboard residue, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it's on the finger right now. But two, up on the board, it's still there. Itty bitty little bitty marks that are on the whiteboard there. The fascinating thing is the more you try to do that by yourself, on your own, the residue is not completely removed. And if you ever seen old whiteboards, we threw one out of the church recently, one because the ledge on it was dangerous for kids to come near because I caught myself throwing it out. But two, those old whiteboards, they have that weird residue, especially if you use red ink or something like that. It stays. It is so hard to get off. When we try to fix our problems on our own, being a good person or whatnot, trying to fool ourselves into thinking that everything's a-okay. In reality, it's not, and it slowly eats away at us. But with Jesus on the cross, when we say yes to Jesus for our own lives, it changes everything. Because instead of us trying to do it ourselves with my finger, Bonnie, if I still have black, all right, you, it's just, it's just white, it's just whiteboard marker. You look terrified. I'll behave, I'll take the high road. I won't ask you to smell, we'll move on. All right, I won't go the high road, will I? Yeah, I heard the groans. Forgive me. But I'll just work with Jesus on the cross instead. It's white clean. It's not about us doing it ourselves. It's white clean. Where in God's eyes, it's as white as snow. In God's eyes, it's completely wiped away. Now, the way you and I look at life, if you look at it closely, you can still see the remnant there. It's still there a little bit. One, because the, mark, the eraser's not perfect. I need to pull out the old, good old whiteboard spray to probably get it off. But two, in our own lives, there's still a shadow of what we've done. Maybe that's why it's so hard for some of us to forgive ourselves. Jesus forgave us, but we want to hang on to it. Jesus forgave us on the cross, but somehow that's not good enough. Are you kidding me? He died for you and for me. We get into our heads and somehow we've got to fix it. And yet, that's not how it works. As we say it so many times here, we are saved by grace. Salvation, it's a... Yeah. Yeah. It's not a... Yeah. For those of you napping, maybe you're guessing today, that's how that works. Because what it gets at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For it's by grace you've been saved through faith. It's a gift of God, not by works, so nobody can boast. What's that mean? We're saved by grace. Or for today, this morning, this morning, we are forgiven by God's grace. Forgiveness, it's a... Oh, I wrote for you guys for a moment. Throw, didn't I? Forgiveness, it's a gift, not a paycheck. Forgiveness, it's a... Yeah. It's not a... Paycheck. We don't earn it. He did the work. It's called the cross. I don't know about you, but I'm not perfect. I'm not even close to it. All you have to do is ask my sister, ask my parents after I busted that door as a kid, ask my wife even this morning. It's a whole different ball of wax when Jesus, the perfect one, paid the price. In the Old Testament, they had to keep on sacrificing animals because people kept on sinning the animals weren't perfect. The only one was perfect. Jesus. See, if you want to know that kind of forgiveness where the, even the remnants are slowly leaving your memory, as in God's eyes, they're no longer held against you. It's about knowing Jesus Christ. There is no other shortcut. There is no other way. He paid the price for you. He paid the price for me. I stand up here on a Sunday morning not by what I've done, but by what he did on the cross for me. If you want to 
want to know that kind of forgiveness from God, then say yes to Jesus Christ. Later on in the service, you want to come forward, we can talk about that, please do so, especially during that final song as we sing it. But at this point, you've got an assignment. So you're going to find in your programs, unless you're playing with the post-it notes in there, you're going to find a really expensive gift. It's all of one post-it note. Yeah, they look like this. They were inside there. Thanks to Connie Snively and Laverne Newton for painfully posting every single one of these post-it notes in your program. Now, if you share the program this morning, here's what I suggest you do. Rip the post-it note in half, or in thirds, or in quarters. Or grab a little piece of your program, the bullets in there, right on it. There are pencils in your pews. Pull out that post-it note. And Bob, if you don't mind showing the next picture, here's what you want to do. You're going to see the post note with the word sins on it there. You put it, if you want to make it personal, make it personal. I suggest when you write something down, you make sure that you get the sticky side like this. Right on the side of the sticky, not the sticky stuff. It doesn't work, I've tried. For me, I just put the word on there now for you to see. Bro sins, fold it in half. So it sticks, so nobody else needs to see what you wrote. If you want to take it home and destroy it, go right ahead. If you want to burn it at home, go right ahead. If you want to use the paper shredder, we'll have out there where I shake hands. Please do, just don't put your fingers inside there. That won't be pretty. But to be intentional about letting it be destroyed. The thing I find about myself, though, is that at times with the sins that I have committed, where I know Jesus has forgiven me, I still, it's as though I go into the paper shredder, grab the piece of the paper, try to fit them back together. But with Jesus and forgiveness, it doesn't work. The slate's quite clean. Look at the whiteboard. It's clean. He paid the price for you and for me. That's your assignment now. I'll give you a minute. If it's a personal one, go ahead and write it down. If it's one where you just have a code word for yourself, use it. If you just want to put sins, go right ahead. Go take that minute now. So my friends, we don't need forgiveness. We ache for Jesus' forgiveness. We do not only want it from our friends, but ultimately from God. But don't treat what you and I have done that separates us from God as what we call sin. Don't treat it forever. It is serious business. So serious there was the cross. So serious that it still hinders us in our relationship with God. It gets in the way. Thanks be to God, though, that Jesus paid the price for us, so there can be real forgiveness. And so at this point, knowing that we can be forgiven, would you pray with me? I encourage you to close your eyes and hold your hands towards heaven as we talk with God. And so, my friends, let us pray. Lord God, loving Father. Lord God, loving Father. I love you. I love you. Thank you for Jesus' cross. Thank you for Jesus' cross. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for forgiveness. Empower me to know your forgiveness. I It's in Jesus' name I pray. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. My friends, let's sing together. And again, if you'd like to talk, you <coughs>
thanks be to God that God's ace is even more serious. Can I say serious, sir? Since I've been making our worst day, we'll just make that one up. All kidding aside, he paid the price for you and for me. Talk about love. As you leave here today, my friends, may you know you're forgiven. As you walk out the building today, may the post-it note not go with you. If you take it home, may it be destroyed. Don't lose it in the laundry in front of three or four weeks later. Instead, deal with it. Ask for God's forgiveness. It begins with the cross we carried on day after day. Thanks be to God that he would forgive us. Talk about love for us. Hold on, Bob.